chapter 4, verse 35. It says this. On that same day, when uh, evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitudes, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. Verse 37. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it, uh, it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to, uh, said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Verse 39. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Somebody say, Just Jesus. Yes. See, Jesus is in the storm. And, uh, you know, we, now we have read the story and we have watched the movie. Wow, that's really quick, isn't it? You know, the thing is, uh, it's an amazing story. Last week we looked at how this woman, she pressed into Jesus in the midst of all the circumstances that were against her, against all cultural and uh, against all the uh, uh, odds that were against her, lined up against her. Yet she went in and pressed in through the crowd, through all obstacles, and she received her healing. You know, the thing is, is uh, the challenges, we know the miracle is there for us, but sometimes the pressing in is where the challenge is. You know, sometimes where we get tired, where we get weak. And today I want to look at this story today, that Jesus is in the storm. And uh, and I believe it's something that we, you and I, can relate to. And we do understand this from reading it and watching that Jesus is God over all elements. Amen. That you know, the winds obey Him, the seas obey Him, everything obeys Him. Hallelujah. Because He is Lord and He is God. Somebody say amen in this place. Because He is. He is. He is God indeed. And here, as we, uh, as we uh, in our text, uh, as we're reading that, that they're out uh, on an evening, just out on a, on a boat. And there were many other boats too. And the scripture tells us uh, that they left and uh, he and his disciples had got on a boat. And a great windstorm arose and the waves beat to the boat. Verse 37 it says, and waters got into the boat. How many of you know, uh, have you ever been on a little boat especially and uh, you're okay until you saw some water get in? I've seen that happen sometimes, you know, you get on the little boat and uh, where you're able to row and next to you find the water is getting in because of a little tiny hole. It's a tiny hole and you're thinking to yourself how either what is faster to row quickly back. Or uh, it'll jump off and do something crazy, or you know, just or how fast the water is going to get into the boat. And there was a windstorm, and the waves were beating, and and, and, and the water was coming into the boat. And uh, it's not good news. And you know, and many times in our lives too, we feel like it's one thing to be in the storm, but the but problem is when the storm gets into your circumstances. When the water gets into your board, that's when we are having some difficulties. We are having some problems. We begin to press a panic button. This is no. This is not. Uh, you know. This is not just a something that's just happening around me. This is something that is happening in me. Maybe there's a trial that you're going through. Maybe there's a difficulty that you're faced with right now. And the turmoil is one thing to know when it's far off. But now you find out that it's right close to you. It's near you. And guess what? It's hurting you. It's painful. And now you're, you are panicking more than ever before. And now the disciples say, come on. Well, what, what is happening here? And they, oh, they're here. They're, uh, you know, they're sailing over uh, to, uh, to, to, to this place. And the scripture tells us in verse 38... That he was, that was Jesus, he was in the stern and he was sleeping. At the back of the ship, at the back of the boat, he was sitting down there and Jesus was fast asleep while the storm was going on, while, this, uh, the, while, the, wa while the boat is getting filled with water. There's got to be something wrong. I mean, the, these guys are panicking. They are they're shouting, they are yelling, and they are, uh, they are really panicking about the situation. And, uh, of course, there's no weather forecast or something to say, this is a storm is going to come. They are already in a storm. And uh, Jesus gets into the ship, uh, in, in, into this boat, and he goes, goes to sleep. It's one of the few times that we really see that he takes sleep. That means really shows us he is not only the son of God, but he's also the son of man. 
How many of you know our bodies are created to get tired? Yes. If you ever thought, oh, I never want to get tired, you are inhuman. Okay? Your body was created to get tired. That means you've got to go to sleep. All right? That's what our body, and that's how God has created us. So we need sleep so that we can recuperate, so we can get better, so we can continue to work hard and work well and give our best. So now, here the, uh, the water is filling, and, and, and these guys are panicking, and Jesus is fast asleep. How insensitive of Jesus to do what he did. I mean, these guys are, don't you think he heard? Okay, let, let, let's just go back for a moment and let's just get this thing straight. He is the Son of God. He is Son of God because He is God's Son who came to us. Because He is God. He is Son of Man because He came in the form of man. He is Son of God. He is Son of Man, but He is God Himself. And now don't you think, I mean, when you, when you have a little bit of thunder and lightning or a bit of rain or something going on, you know, I don't know, even this morning I could hear the winds were really strong. And I, and I got up and uh, hearing the winds early hours of the morning and, and I could hear it. And don't tell me there's a wind, there's a whirlwind that's going on, that the, wind, that the waves that are beating against the boat. And water is, uh, the boat is getting filled with water. And these guys are shouting and yelling on top of their voice. And Jesus is fast asleep. There's, a, there's something terribly wrong about this picture here. Something so terribly wrong about Jesus' attitude towards this whole situation. Correct? Come on. You are the only Christian in the boat. Let's assume. And the rest of them, they don't know any, any from, you know, they don't have any belief or they're, they're, they're not following, you know, they have their, sorry, their faith in God. And now they, although you're the only Christian and here your boat is it, 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 tossed back and forth, is a wind that's going off, what would you do? Go to sleep? Apart from panic, what, 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 what would you do? You would at least whisper a prayer, correct? At least you would say, God, help us. God, I, I pray for this situation. God, intervene in our situation. Do something about it. Is that, is that something that we, and I believe at least that's the most sensible thing to do. Correct? Come on. Yeah. Is it the most sensible thing to do? Because you've got to, you've got to call on for help. But here Jesus is thinking it's rock of my baby. Not on a tree top, but on the seas, you know, and, 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 and all this uh, rough seas and everything making Jesus more comfortable. And Jesus, what is happening? Why aren't you? And the disciples, they come up to him, on a, why are you sleeping on a pillow? That means he was quite comfortable. It was just not like he put something on. He was nicely comfortable in a pillow. And they woke him up and he said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? How many of you have ever been in the place and you've said, God, don't you care what's going on in my life? God, don't you care? Have you ever felt like Jesus is sleeping on you sometimes? Come on, Jesus, where are you? You are working a miracle in that person's life. You are doing something great in that nation. But how about me right here? Have you forgotten me? Have you forgotten my address? Have you forgotten my name? God, when are you going to come through for me, God? I know you are great in those countries. I know you are doing great in those people's lives. But how about my life? You are sleeping, Jesus. Look at my boat. My boat is getting worse and worse. Water is getting into my boat. I am sinking. And Jesus, where are you? You are sleeping, Master, Lord, Savior, Alpha, the Omega. Are you there? If you're honest with ourselves, how many of us have felt that way? Yes, yes, yes. He's sleeping. That means he's so insensitive. <laughs> if you have been invited to someone's house and the host is sleeping when you arrive, do you think it's a very polite gesture? No. It's not. It's rude. They're going to be waiting for you. They're going to be anticipating for you. And look at this. Jesus is, is, is here with them. My, uh, keep in mind, all right? This is Matthew chapter 4. In, in the same story happens in, uh, excuse me, Mark chapter 4. The same story happens, uh, occurs in Matthew chapter 8. In, in the account of uh, the Matthew writes. That means if you read it in both these, uh, uh, in both the stories that are written by both Mark, uh, Matthew and Mark, 
They have witnessed so many miracles already. They've gone through the uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount. That means they've heard about the Beatitudes. They've heard all the teachings of Jesus. They pretty much they know the constitution of the kingdom of God. They have seen blind eyes open. They have seen miracles. They witnessed the, the feeding of the four thousand people. They have witnessed number of miracles already. And now they are in this boat and and they're panicking and saying, Jesus, come on, wake up! And here they, and they make a very powerful statement. They say, Teacher. They didn't call him Lord. The same teacher, because he's been teaching them a lot of things. He says, teacher, because they've been t t learning and learning and learning. So they're referring him to him as teacher. Do you not care that we are perishing? How many of you know when we go through something in life, we get so self-absorbed? Yes. We get so self-centered. Yes. We always feel our problem, my problem is bigger than anybody else's. You know, your problem will only as big as uh, you think it is until you've met somebody else. Yes. Your problem will be the biggest and the greatest, the massive problem. Wait till you talk to somebody else and you find out how small your problem is. Yes. You will find out how insignificant your problem is. You find out that what you are going through is not as bad as somebody else's. You find out how, how, you know, you know, how uh, gracious God has been in your life. And you find out that, uh, uh, yes, it is a, uh, yes, you have water getting into your boat, and guess what? Your boat might be sinking. Maybe in your life there's no change that has been happening. And every time you would love to praise the Lord. Just like my sister, just like she encouraged in prayer a while ago. And I believe it's in the book of Habakkuk where she's saying, no matter what happens, when everything fails, when everything around me fails, but yet will I praise you. Well, theoretically, that sounds good. Theoretically, that sounds good. On paper, that sounds good. But in reality, come on. Don't we ask those questions? Don't we feel like that sometimes? We do. Maybe some of you are feeling like that right now. I do. Say, Jesus, where are you? Yeah. Well, you know, we, we're hearing all these songs that we sing. The prayers are prayed. There's the shouts of praises. But my boat is sinking. Somebody say, my boat is sinking. My, my boat is sinking. Where are you, Jesus? Are you? Wake up, Jesus. Wake up. And we are honest with ourselves. That's what happens to us. And say, Jesus, where are you? I don't see your handiwork in my life. I don't see your miraculous work in my life. I don't see you doing anything. Jesus, when will you wake from your sleep? But at the same time, I read the scriptures. The Bible says, he never sleeps nor slumbers. <laughs> You're contradicting yourself, Jesus. Because you're the word, right? You never sleep, no slumber, but yet now you're sleeping in my situation. You're not coming through for me. And many times we have these questions, but let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we can learn to address these things. We're going to understand why Jesus did what he did. There are times Jesus will allow our boats to be filled with water. But he's a God who will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. Amen. I would rather be in a sinking ship with Jesus than a floating ship without Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Because I know, I know that I know that I know. Even if my ship, my boat might be sinking, as long as Jesus is with me, I'm okay. If I'm going down, he's going down with me. Amen. And the chances are, he's not going down. Amen. So that means I'm not going down either because the word of God tells us he always causes me to triumph. Amen. Praise be to God who always causes us to triumph. Not sometimes, but always. Somebody say always. 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 He always causes us to triumph. Hallelujah. And he helps us. Uh, and he is with us. Amen. You see, you can have a, a, a boat. You can never have a that, that is sailing well and doing well and without Jesus, but you just don't know what is ahead. That's why he was boasted about the Titanic. It is unsinkable. It will not sink. It will not happen at all. It will not happen. And, 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 and then because you know there was, there was arrogance and the pride of man that was in that ship. And any time when there's arrogance and pride in our own self, let me tell you, that's the beginning of your sinking. 
Sinking is just not sinking when the water is in your ship. Sinking is when you and I, we start managing our lives with our own wisdom, with our own pride, with our arrogance, with our own ways, with our own selfish ways, with our own self-centered ways. That's when your boat, your ship starts sinking and you will never even know it's sinking. Yes. But when you have Jesus in that ship, when you have Jesus in that boat, oh, thank you, Jesus. It might be chaos. It might be all kinds of things that's going on, but he will make sure your head is above the water. Amen. Not only he'll cause your head to be above water, but he'll cause you to walk on water. Amen. He'll cause you to work <laughs> miracles. He'll, work, he'll turn things around. But here Jesus is testing the disciples something. All this while, they've been hearing about the constitution, about the kingdom of God, the Sermon on the Mount, every, all the wonderful teachings of Jesus. But Jesus is teaching how to build your house. You be a wise man and build your house upon the rock. Don't just build your house on the sand. And he's teaching them all this. And you begin to work miracles. You begin to work all kinds of things. Now, when it really comes down to it, the question is, can the disciples believe? So you and I can know the scriptures. You and I could have the greatest of revelation. But if you have no application, it's all it's nothing. If you cannot apply it where you really need it. You can say, I know the word. I'm so strong. I pray for hours and everything. But when it really comes down to it. One of the sports I like to watch is the, is the racing, the Formula Formula One racing, and of course everybody, every every of their, uh, uh, you know, uh, every other team, they boast about their cars. The Ferrari says their our cars are the best. Uh, the BMW they say their cars are the best. But how many of you know which is the best at the end of the season? Who's sitting on the top and who's sitting in the bottom? If your car is the best, you'll be on the top. Yes. You will prove it. So you can say as much as you want, how much you know the scriptures, how dedicated you are to God, how committed you are to God. When it really comes down to the storms of life, that's when you know how strong you are. Amen. How, uh, you know, the thing is that you've got to bring that what's on your head to the heart. Just like the woman with the issue of blood last year, we saw that uh, last week. We saw that how she pressed it. She knew uh, the, 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 the cultural reasons. She knew that she was not, she not just didn't go touch the, head, touch the feet of Jesus, the hand of Jesus, uh, or the head of Jesus, or the hair of Jesus. Anywhere she would have touched Jesus, she would have been healed. But she knew something uh, even more than that. Uh, she knew that he was a priest, uh, and, and, he had, and he had the prayer shawl, uh, the talit over him, uh, and she went and touched the hem of his garment which speaks of healing, which speaks about the authority of the Word of God, which speaks about the Word of God in itself, that there's healing in His ways for the Master, from the Master, for her. And that's what she did. But she, she didn't just leave it in the head, but I know all this. See, knowing everything is good, but it's not good enough if you don't bring it down to where you need to apply. Revelation is good, but revelation in itself will not sustain you. See, Peter had a great revelation. Jesus said, who are you? Uh, who, excuse me. Jesus said, who do, you, who do people say I am? And he said, well, some say this, some say And Jesus said, what do you say? He said, you are, you are, you are God. You are the Lord. And Jesus, said, and Jesus said, yes, the flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but you're my Father in heaven. But later on, Jesus called him Satan. Get behind me, Satan. He does the most foolish things. Why? It's one thing to have a revelation. But if you want to walk in the revelation, you've got to learn how to apply that revelation. It's one time you say, wow, this is what it said. But you've got to learn to apply in your circumstances, in your situations. Let me tell you, the greatest growth that you will have in life is not when you're just sitting down and learning, when you're just uh, receiving. You, you do have, there is growth in it. Yes, you do develop in it, and you do need it. But the greatest growth takes place when you start applying it in your circumstances. They say anything you learn in life, if you don't apply it immediately, you will lose it. Yes. Somehow, either if, if you don't have an immediate situation for you to apply it, share it with somebody so that you will get your system and get anything in life. You got to apply it. it. It is a matter of days if you don't do it. If you don't apply it, it's so important for us. And here the disciples, and that's why they say teacher. Teacher. Because teacher has been teaching. And students have been learning. So you can say, I'm so well prepared for my exams. I'm so good, I have learned, I know my topics, but you don't know how good you are until you get your results. Yeah. 
I know everything about my topic. I know everything about my subject. That's good. That's commendable. That's fantastic. You have really put out of effort. But let's see when the results come out, how much work you put in. Let's see how good you are. That's what really matters. That's what really, when it really comes down to it, when we apply. But you see what Jesus says here in verse 39. He says, Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Amen. Peace, be still. Verse 38 is what we call the Logos. Logos meaning is the written word of God. But rhema is the word that comes alive. The disciples knew the written word of God. They, they heard the teaching, but it never became a real to them. See, a word becomes real to you when you start applying it. When you start meditating on it. When you start confessing it. You can have a lot of head knowledge, but if you don't apply it, it'll always be, it'll always be a logos. You always say, teacher, teacher. Teacher. The teacher taught, but now the teacher is putting the students to test. Don't you think that Jesus already knew that was going to be a storm? That Je did Jesus know already before he even got on the boat? But what did the teacher do? He taught them first. He taught them. Now, I'm going to, see, every time you learn something, it has to be tested. Because if you're not, if it's not tested, you will never know what you learned is right or wrong, whether it's good or not good. See, in this church, even if you come here, no matter how long you've been coming, what you learn in this church, you'll want to know it is whether it is of God and whether it is good when you go through it. Whether what I learn from my Bible studies, from some days that I go to church, and the preaching of the Word, the ministry of the Word, and everything that I learn, if, whether when I embrace it and when I start applying it, if it starts working in my life, you know the fruit of it. And you see the fruit from it. And that's how we see. You see, I, I've been sharing this stuff in the, this past week. Sometimes it's hard to gauge our spiritual growth. You know, last week Pastor Neil gave a thought about, uh, uh, was sharing on the offering about uh, uh, our Calvary Church's finances. Said this amount of money that came in, this money for, for expenses, and we have this amount of money left over. That's great. It's good math. And it's easy for us to understand, yes, it's been a good, uh, a lot of dollar challenges, but financially it's been healthy. We have progressed, we've done well. But how do you measure spiritual life? How do you measure it? What kind of uh, measurement are you going to put in next to? Somebody said, you know, we can have 10 Bible studies. We can have all kind of courses going through the week. We have a course on Monday on this, on Tuesday we have another course, Wednesday we have this course, Thursday we have a course, after we have course out. Saturday we can run meetings for our church from morning till night. Sundays we can run so, course, 10 courses before service, 10 courses after service. You attend this for marriage, for this, for that, and everything. We have all the education the church that's going on. Okay. Wow. Calvary Church has very good Christian education going on. You guys are very good. From the outside, yes. It's good. You, we are busy. We are active. Doesn't mean we are proactive, we are productive. We are active because we got a lot of things going on. But now, after going through all that, how do you know you have grown? Well, I know about this, I know about that. Well, you know about all this. But how do you know that you have progressed spiritually? Think about that for a moment. How do you know you are progressing in your spiritual life? It's very hard to measure. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. I've got, I don't have a tape to put it next to. I don't have any kind of measuring scales to put it under, to put it next to. You know, like, like we, we talk about money, we can put it, we can match it with figures. Straightforward. Growth of an individual, of a child, you grow taller, okay, healthy, we can measure those things. But your spiritual life, how are you going to measure? How are you going to know that you are progressing, that you are advancing, that you're moving forward? How are you going to do that? How is that going to take place? I'll go back to this statement that I made and make it many times. You don't know how good a tea bag tea is until you put it in hot water. I don't know about you, this past week I've been drinking a lot of tea, especially with the cold weather. 
And every time you put that bag inside, different flavors, it comes out. The flavor comes out. And many times Christians are like tea bags. You don't know what you're made of until you are in hot water. It's just like a guy who's saying, he looks at this girl and he said, I'm going to, I'm going to marry you and I'm going to love you. And then in all that, you know, and also uh, or a husband uh, or a woman at the, and a man at the altar, they come up and say, oh, it's a sickness and in hell to death do us part. And uh, they go through all that. Or this girl says, I'm, I'm going to love you no matter what happens. I'm going to be with you. Sounds good. And I've heard people sometimes, you now of course, you know, they write on the, uh, sometimes in the social media, and say, today I'm going to marry my best friend, my love of my life, oh, my soulmate, my this, my that, and they just go on and on. That's fantastic. I would like to see the same words. Somebody wrote that, and I told, I told I my wife, they should take a copy and keep it. <laughs> and review it like every anniversary they have. I'm, I, I mean, I was not being sarcastic, I was just being honest, really. Because those are beautiful words, but you got to remember, remember yourself. Remind yourself where you put your heart. And we can say that, oh, until death do us, but no matter what, no matter what sickness comes, I'm going to be with you, I'm going to be by your side. It's easy to say because he is okay and she is okay. What happens if she's got a terminal illness? She's going to die anyway. I'm leaving you right now. Bye-bye. What happens if he loses his leg? He can't work no more. You married a, you, you know, I mean, you can't marry this guy. He was a good looking guy. The guy who just got off your GQ magazine or something. You're looking good and everything. And executive, worth a lot of money. Something happens a lot. He can't bring money no more into the house. Pretty much it's useless. Are you still going to love him till death do us proud? We are partying, honey. That's what's happening. We're not going to be together. We are partying. Away. See, it's easy to say all those things. I love you. Even for a simple thing. Oh, I love you. But the question is this. It's not loving when it's lovable. Loving when everything is okay. But can you love when everything is going south? Can you love when everything is going sour? Can you love when everything is, uh, when, when things are difficult uh, and there's a little bit of trouble in paradise? Then can you love? Now you're going to quiet on me. <laughs> it's one thing to say. It's one thing to know. How this thing is. I love this and that. I mean, the big question we can ask when it really comes down to it, are you going to stick to what you have said, to what you have committed? I remember people say, oh, I'm committed to my company. No matter what, I'm, I, I, I'm giving my 110% to this company. Soon as the slightest problem happens in the company, they are out. So much for dedication and commitment and loyalty. It's the same thing that's happening here to the disciples. They learn everything. They got excited about the Word of God. They got encouraged about the Word of God. They were, they were on a high from the Word of God. But now when it really came down to it, they're saying, Jesus, don't you care? Don't you think, gee, don't you think they knew before the storm that Jesus cared about them? Of course. He, did, he had enough evidence to show through his teaching and through his life that he cared about his disciples. But now all, when, when it really comes down to it, they're questioning him by saying, but simply because he was sleeping. Don't you care about us, Jesus? You are so insensitive to us. You don't even care about us. We are water in our boat and we are sinking right now and you're fast asleep. But what did he say? In the Sermon on the Mount, if you build your house upon the rock, and when the wind comes, when the storm comes, you will send the test of time yes. for God. How easy we forget when we are in the fire ourselves. That means we only hear and never meditate and bring the word of God to heart. Because that's when you go through the test of time, you know that you know. If God be for you, who can be against you? If God be for you, who can be against you? See, you can make whatever commitment you want to make to your loved one, to work, to family. But when testing comes, in sickness, are you faithful? When you don't have money, are you still faithful? When things are not working out, are you still faithful? Are you holding on to your marriage vow? Are you holding on to your commitment that you have made? Are you holding on? 
I shot with our man last yesterday. When you get married, there are three rings. <laughs> the engagement ring, the wedding ring, and then the suffering. <laughs> but do you know the third ring? You know why it happens? Because there's a fourth ring to it. Suffering happens because after the wedding ring, there's a bore ring. <laughs> because it's boring, marriage gets boring, that's when you have suffering. Come on. Oh, I'm suffering because you know why? It's boring. Suddenly, the one you said, I'm marrying my soulmate. I'm love. I'm marrying the love of my life. I'm marrying my best friend. What happened? The boring. <laughs> and now I am suffering. <laughs> when it gets boring, it will you'll start to suffer. What happened? I'm going to love you all of my life. I'm going to massage your feet all the days of my life. As long as I tell you I've got my strength in my body. As long as I have hands. I'm going to massage my, your feet all the days. And after like two months of the wedding. Oh, your feet, forget that. Oh, go and get $20, $49.45 minutes. Go and get your foot massage. But before that, oh, we smooth talk. We read all these nice words and everything comes out. And suddenly it gets boring. Marriages suffer because the boring, the fourth ring, which is actually the third ring, gets into it. And suffering is it's almost an automatic uh, thing that happens. Because boring gets into it after the wedding ring. <laughs> See, and the same thing as disciples. It's one thing to learn, one thing to do, all that. But we've got to apply. We've got to apply. But you say, well, my situation is different. Your situation is not different from anybody else's. The Word of God is a principle. And principles work regardless of any situation. It could be different. It could be something, but the principles work. God's Word works. Somebody say, God's Word works. God's Word works. And here he says, he arose in verse 39. He arose and rebuked the wind and the sea. Peace be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. He got up and he said, peace be still. It's interesting. We all, of course, we understand that Jesus is a prince of peace. Isn't that right? You know, the word peace right here is not the word that we think it is. It's shalom. The word shalom in Hebrew, which is, you know, we are, many of you might be familiar with. In, uh, in, in Greek, it is uh, the word irene uh, that is used. And it simply means, uh, uh, meaning peace as in a harmony, wholeness, completeness, prosperity, welfare, tranquility. And of course the Jewish people would use it uh, to both to say hello and to say goodbye. And that is shalom, peace. But that's not the word that is used. Shalom is not the word that is used right here. When Jesus said peace, he's not saying shalom. He's not saying wholeness to the uh, wind. He's not using that. He's not using the word, uh, oh, may there be uh, a completeness. To the, no, he's not saying that. He's not saying hello. <laughs> he's not saying that either. And, not, and of course, he said goodbye to it in a different way. <laughs> but the word, and of course, uh, that similar word in Greek is used, the Irene, that's used in, uh, in the New Testament. But the interesting thing is you would like this. The word, in, uh, it, 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 the word that is used right here when Jesus said peace is a word that is spelled this way. S-I-O, P-A-O. And let me tell you how it is pronounced. It's pronounced, I'm not kidding you, it's pronounced as Subao. I'm not kidding you. You go to any of the uh, in the Bible dictionaries and I was thinking to myself, this is Subao. I mean, this pronoun, the spelling is S-I-O. P-A-O! Supao! I'm not making this up. Check out the word of God, alright? It is Supao. So what Jesus said? Supao! Come on, everybody say Supao. There you go, that's it. Supao! The word is Supao, which means, which means silence, a hush, muteness, involuntary stillness, or inability to speak. Shut up. Be quiet. That's what it means, simply. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this word, right? It's not the shalom peace he's talking about. Here he's talking about siupa. 
It's not easy for you. What did you learn today at church about you? Yeah. I mean, I, because there's this, there's a little speak, you know, thing you can press on this, and then I kept on listening to this guy. He said, Am I hearing it in my head or just, I kept on hearing like a few times, this year, Paul, year, Paul. I'm like, okay, this is a Greek word, all right? And what, you know, for in, in Greek it's peace, but in uh, for us in Hong Kong, it's you, Paul. Okay? So what Jesus is saying is, shoot Paul. What he's saying is to the wind is, shut up. Be quiet. Let me tell you, when, Jesus, when you have Jesus in your boat, he will... Shut anything, every work of the enemy in your life. Amen. Next time, you have, when you are in a situation and things are going every which direction, just say, shoot out. Come on, everybody say, shoot out. Shoot out. That's it. Shoot out. Just tell, shoot out. Shoot out. You just go ahead. You just go ahead and do it. You see, that's what Jesus does. In your circumstances, just that Daniel was in the lion's den. And here the lion, he was afraid. I mean, he was not afraid. He had, he had total confidence to God. Whether he lived or died, he know God's, you know, he was living to please God and he was not going to go against God in any, any way. But he went in there, he told the lions, shoot bow. <laughs> shoot bow, just shut up, lions. And what the Bible tells God closed the mouth of the lions. I tell you, when Jesus is near board, it doesn't matter. It see, when you have the peace of God, peace of God is not the absence of problem. Peace of God, it simply means that in the midst of your problems, you can have the faith in God that God will shoot bow all your problems. Yeah. He, will, he, will, he, will, he will shut it down. He will, it's an involuntarily, Voice on it's on the wind says, Okay, I will back. No, no, you speak to it. Yes. What Jesus is teaching here is the power of spoken word. Yes. You speak, yes. you speak to your situation. God, I know it's kind of crazy, I feel like my body is sinking, but I speak in faith. I speak yes. in faith. I declare when I look at the face, it seems like the face is not going to change. But she power in the name of Jesus, uh, hallelujah. Yes. You're working a miracle in the place, uh, you're working a miracle. In my situation, oh God, I know. Oh God, everything is coming against me. I pray in the name of Jesus. Shoot out in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You didn't know Cantonese was in that Bible, huh? Shoot out. Shoot out. Silence, hush, muteness, involuntary stillness, or inability to speak, to shut up, to be quiet. You see, no storm will come without the knowledge of God in your life. God is never too surprised. Oh, wow. I didn't know you have a problem, Alan. God knows. There's no storm that comes that he's not aware of. He knows every single thing. He knows the storm. He knows if you're sinking, too. It seems like he is insensitive. It seems like, God, where are you when I really need you most? God, where are you when, when I really want you to come and intervene in my situation? I want to let you know, as long as the Lord is with you, whether he does something or he doesn't do something, you are okay. Amen. You don't need him to do something for you to be okay. Even if he doesn't do anything, you're still okay because you are with God. Because that's what peace is. Peace is knowing that God is with me. No matter what happens. Amen. If he's saying something, praise be to God. If he's not saying, praise be to God. If he's doing something, praise be to God. If he's lifting up his hand and saying, peace be still, praise be to God. If he's not, if he's sleeping, let him sleep. <laughs> I'd rather have a sleeping Jesus in my boat than a boat that doesn't have Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. A boat that's trying to figure out things in life with all wisdom of man, with all the intellect, in, in, intelligence of man. Trying to figure things out. I'd rather have a sleeping Jesus. Because I have confidence. Because he's not panicking. As long as he's not panicking, I will not panic. One of the things I do about when I travel, especially to uh, remote areas and countries, if, if something happens, I don't, I, I don't usually don't panic. I try, you know, try my best to keep calm. And I, and I have this rule for myself. I will only panic when the local people panic. <laughs> you know, oh, Pastor, don't worry about it. I said, okay, don't worry, I'm not worried about it. If you panic, I panic because you are the one who have the local knowledge. I don't. If you panic, I'm running faster than you. 
I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm going to outrun you. That's the only way possible. You know, if Jesus is not panicking, now tell the person next to you, Jesus is not panicking. Jesus. Tell somebody else, Jesus is not worried. He's not worried about anything. So don't worry. Shoot out. Tell somebody, shoot out. Shoot out. Yes. Shoot out. That's right. Tell somebody else, shoot out. Tell somebody, shoot out. Be on you. Shoot out. Be upon you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Storms will change you for good or bad. Depends on how you handle it. It all depends how you handle it. God will not allow a storm in my life to destroy my life. But through it, I can go higher and closer to Him. Amen. He will never allow a storm that He's not aware of. And He will never allow a storm to destroy you. Hallelujah. We have to come to a place in our walk with the Lord. Where we just trust Him no matter what. You know, if I were to ask, I'm looking at Dr. Evelyn for a moment. I don't know, Dr. Evelyn, can you think about a medicine that would help us? Give me a scientific name. Give me a scientific name that is going to blow. Panadol is already scientific for me, but something more that blows my mind. Like with a lot of X's and Y's and O's and all that kind of blows my mind. Say something. It doesn't matter. Make up one. It doesn't matter. I wouldn't even know. For, for you know, it's like if she were to give a name. Do you have anything in your head right now? Any medicine comes to your mind? Any medicine? For something. Stomach ache. And she says, she, you, I want you to take supercalifragilis, HP, I know she's kind of, you know, it's like kind of a thing. And we have more confidence in taking a medicine that we can't even pronounce. We have more confidence in taking a medicine we don't even know how to spell. Or at least me. We have more confidence in something we don't even know what, that the guy just made up all these things. Then to say, only believe. Yes. All things are possible. Yes. It, it, it's kind of amazing. You know, you know, the, the doctor says something and it's like such a big word. Ah, it's got to cure me. Ah, but Jesus said, only believe. Yes. Jesus said, peace be still. Sometimes things which are too elementary, we think it's not powerful enough. Sometimes the most powerful things are the simplest of things. Amen. Jesus said to a sick man, he didn't even pray for the sick man. You know what he said? Go. He got healed. He didn't pray for him. He didn't lay hands on him. He said, you're sick? Okay, Jesus, I need to get healed. He said, Jesus said, go. As simple as that. No, oh, Jesus, you got to lay hands on me. You got to prescribe for me. Oh, we need all this. No, no. He said, go. The woman of the issue of blood, she did, Jesus did not even lay hands on her. Jesus did not even pray for her. Jesus, did, Jesus, all he said was this, woman, you have been hiding your faith too long. Now I want you to make a stand up for your faith and make your faith known to everybody. And by the way, you, you know, make sure my disciples go to another level in their faith. Come on, make a stand. Teach them a lesson. Now you're, you're made whole. You're healed in Jesus' name. It's so interesting that we, 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 we rather put our trust in some complex thought or idea. And something which is so simple, Jesus said, only believe. Isn't that amazing? It's just like salvation. How many of you know salvation is the interruption? How many of you ever got planned to save, to get saved? They said, when I reach 25, I'm going to get saved. When I reach 18, uh, after my uh, in a school, I'm going to get saved. When I get to 14, after my exams, during my summer holidays, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to get saved. How many of you ever planned like that? No, salvation is an interruption. It comes and interrupts everything about your life. Yes. When you're in school or when you're at work or any, part, any time of your life, when you came in, you just came in and interrupted and messed up everything in your life. God will never allow a storm that He is not aware of. It's so easy for us. It's so easy for us to discard those things. When it, with salvation, when you talk about it, Jesus said, if you believe with your heart, if you confess Him with your mouth, you'll be saved. It's not, it's like, wow, that's too easy. But we prefer walking around everywhere. 
for 100 kilometers. We walk on fire, we walk through the river, we climb up the mountain, we stand in the cold for a while. Now I'm saved. Oh, I feel saved. Why? That's we are saved by works. But salvation is a gift of God. It's so hard. Is it just that easy? Yes, it is. But it requires faith. It requires faith. And here is the same thing, ladies and gentlemen, that we got to understand that sometimes when what Jesus says is so simple. If Jesus said only believe, why can't we just believe? If Jesus is sleeping and he is the Prince of Peace, why can't I just trust him that he will work it, all everything okay? Even if I feel like I'm sinking, even if I feel like everything is going bad to worse in my life, even if it seems like nothing is happening, all I do is I speak confessing the word of God. Jesus is saying, peace be still, peace be still. See, God, Jesus is teaching us the power of the spoken word, the power of speaking his scriptures. I Have you stopped speaking the word of God in your life? Keep speaking, keep speaking, just like the Ezekiel, the dry bones. You speak to those dry bones. You speak to your situation. There's power in the word of the Lord. There's power in the spoken word. Hallelujah. Speak the word of the Lord. Say, Shiva. Shiva. Hallelujah. That's right. I don't know if you're thinking about power and all that right now. There's a problem of preaching this sermon in Hong Kong. Everybody's hungry now. Nahum chapter 1. Nahum chapter 1. I took the liberty of putting this up on the screen because I know it's kind of hard to look it up in our Bibles. Can have our pages, kind of, these kind of books where the papers really stick to each other. We don't visit these kind of books too long. But you know what? It's good today that we are able to read Nahum chapter 1 verse 3. You know why? I, I, I just want to keep it as soft as possible. I don't want heaven to hear it. Because uh, when you go to heaven one day and when you meet Brother Nahum, at least you can tell him I read something from your Bible, from your book. So read something from Obadiah, read something from Zephaniah, see something from Joel, read something so that when you meet all these brothers uh, up there in heaven, at least you can tell them, uh, uh, did you read my book? <laughs> Actually, I didn't know you, that was a book called Nahum in the Bible. So at least we have something today. Okay, so, so we read from Nahum and brother Nahum will be very happy today. And it says this, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not, uh, will not at all acquit the wicked. And I want to look at this. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. The Lord has his way. Not the Lord panics in the whirlwind. The Lord is scared of a whirlwind. The Lord is afraid of a whirlwind. The Lord doesn't know what to do when the winds and storms of life come about. No, he has his way. That means he is in control. He is the true power. He is the peace in the midst of the storm. Where he can control the storm. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. Think about that for a moment. He is in charge. He is in control. So no matter what storm you are facing in your life, he is in it. He is in the eye of the storm. He is in the midst of the storm. He is in the middle of the storm. So don't you worry a single bit if your boat is sinking. Because if you feel like your boat is sinking, He is not going to let you drown. Amen. He's going to just let you let your feet wash a little bit. Let me say, hey, you need a little bit of foot washing. I'm going to let the sea do some salt work in it. Sea salt. Apply to your feet. He has his way in the wilderness. Think about it. God does not panic when you are panicking. I'll panic when God panics. But by the way, I got news this morning that he's not. Amen. Last when I read the Bible, he's still not panicking yet. He's okay. He's all in control. He's in charge. Is that what your Bible says to Andy? Is God panicking and he knows no news, right? No alerts, no notifications. No. God is okay. If he's okay, I'm okay. Even though my situation will not be okay, I'm okay because he's okay. Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. So no matter what you're going through, no matter what storm you're going through, if the Lord is okay, if he's, in, he's having his way and he's in control of everything, don't you worry about anything. Tell the person next to you, don't you worry about anything. Don't you worry about anything. Tell the person next to you, Shupa. Shupa. And, you know, and the clouds, and the clouds, are the dust of his feet. Simple science. Simple science. We learn this. 
The clouds drop down dew. We have rain, correct? So this, that's where the storms are. What he's saying is, his, the storms are under his feet. The clouds are the dust of his feet. That means he's walking on top of the storm. Come on. Did you get that? Did you get that? You got to bring it from your head to your heart right there. He is your situation. God is not over. Your situation in life that you're facing, it's not over God. It's under. He's something that he's walking over. That means if everything that you have is in Christ, everything that Jesus has is yours and you are joint heir with Jesus. Uh, if Jesus is walking in victory, how many of you know you and I are walking in victory too? Yeah. The Bible tells us, uh, thanks be to God, who always causes us to triumph. If he is walking in victory and he is triumphant, so are we victorious. So are we walking in. So are we triumphant in every circumstances, every situation. He is. He has his way in the wind. He has his way in the storm. He is in control of your situation, and he also has everything under his feet. That means everything is under his control. For some of us, our storms are over our heads, but for him. The storms are under his feet. Yes. That's why it's so important for us to have our position in him. Yes. It's not about your condition. Say, it's not about my condition. No, no, no. You, you got to say it aloud. It's not about my condition. It's, about my condition. it's about my position. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. That's your position. Your position is in Christ. When you go away from your position, you're going to be under your circumstances. Is anyone is in Christ? You got to see your position will change everything about your condition. And your connection is more important than your situation. Amen. So your condition doesn't matter what it is. Your situation, it doesn't matter as long as you take your position. Your position is in Christ. If you are in Christ, and if God has His way in the wilderness, and in the wilderness, excuse me, in the whirlwind and the storm, if He is sleeping, and if your position is in Christ, don't you worry about it. You just tell Jesus, keep sleeping, Jesus. That's all right. We won't say that, don't we? <laughs> Wake up, Jesus. What's happening to me? Don't you care about me? Yeah. That's when you leave your position. When you leave your position, it's all about me, about my problem. But when you are in his position, you will say, it doesn't matter. If he's not spoken yet, yet will I trust him. Yes. If nothing is happening, yet will I praise him. Yes. It's hard, yes. It's painful, yes. It's a bit uh, challenging, yes. I don't know what to do, but that's okay. I put my trust in the Lord. I put my trust in the word of God. And his, the clouds are under are the dust of his feet. That means he's got, he got me covered. I'm good. I'm all right. You see, the eagles are the only birds that fly into a storm. They fly into a storm because it pushes them higher and get a higher perspective. And how many of you know, we as Christians, the Bible likens us, as eagles. Amen. We will mount up as, as eagles. We will soar like an eagle. Yes. Hallelujah. And many times, that's why I'm telling you, God will never bring a storm that he's not aware of. And he never brings it, he never allows a storm uh, the, to, to, to draw us away from him, but as always draw us closer to him. And through the storms that we go through in life, uh, and what happens, just like the eagle, it pushes us towards him. I pray through the circumstances that you go through, situations that you go through, that you're drawing closer to Him. You're drawing closer to God. Yes. Hallelujah. We draw closer and closer. But we always have this question. God, when are you going to do it? Is that correct? Yes. yes. When are you going to do it, Lord? When are you going to come through for me? When is my miracle ever going to take place? We have been holding on to the promises of God. In the last quarter of last year, the Lord has given us so many prophetic words and that we believe maybe some of us are facing more challenges than we ever faced before. That we ever seen in our life. We are facing more difficulties than ever before. It's a test. 
God gave his people a prophetic word that I will liberate you. I will set you free from the bondage of Egypt for 432 years. But did it happen overnight? It did not. But God also tested them to see how faithful are they to the word that he gave them. The, the test for us today, it's either it's going to be a matter of weeks or it's going to be years before we walk into the promises that God has. It depended upon you and me how we respond to our storms. There was a storm that came about for Egypt and that is that when they went to the promised land, they saw giants. They said, oh, there's a huge storm. What happened? A while ago, they were rejoicing and praising God. They were out of, they, they, they lost their position. They gave away their position to the enemy, to the giants. Don't you ever give up your position to your circumstances. Take your position. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Take your position. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. And you speak the word of God to your circumstances. There might be all kinds of, but you say, see power. You say, it's peace in the name of Jesus. Peace in the name of Jesus. God will turn your situation, your circumstances around for his glory. Amen. Amen. Just like the eagle, it pushes the eagle to, to a higher place. I believe your circumstance, situation that you're going through, as you hold on to Jesus, as you're, as you're holding on to his promise, he'll push it in greater height. First, 1 Peter 3, 9 tells us, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. And some would count slackness. He's never going to be late. Maybe late in your calendar. Maybe late in your time. Maybe late according to your timeline. But according to Him, He will do it when it's the right time. Amen. His time. He will not slack concerning His promise. Any promise. Every promise that is written in this book. He's never going to be late. Amen. But the challenge for you is this. He is the Prince of Peace. Amen. And I'm going to hold on to the Prince of Peace. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He is with me. Amen. Peace. He said, be still. He said, Shubha, be still. Shubha, be still. That's what he said.